Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for Welcome to Galaxy High, an episode of Galaxy High School produced by TMS Entertainment. Now, growing up, Galaxy High School was one of my favourite cartoons, and that's saying something given that it had 13 episodes in total. But I still remember to this day watching this show for the first time and being utterly enthralled by it. The visuals are so very strong for this show, and that is, of course, thanks to the wonderful work of Tokyo Movie Shinsha. One of the people that worked on this show was the late, great Larry Dottilio. He was the story editor for this show. He wrote four episodes in total, and thus story edited all the scripts, which is why the series is so very strong. Even though we all tend to think of Larry Dottilio as an action-adventure writer, He-Man, She-Ra, Bionic 6, so many other shows. He was a great comedy writer too, as can be seen in a lot of his action adventure series. And Galaxy High School is not an action adventure show, it's a comedy show. This being the pilot, it is written by the individual who developed the series, Chris Columbus, who you may know. Look him up if you don't. He's done a few things in Hollywood, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> Going back to Larry Dottilio, the last time I saw him was in 2017. And Myself and my friend Lee Clevenger went to his house and he sat there and entertained us with stories of his career in animation. I'd known Larry at this point for nearly 20 years, but I was talking to him about Galaxy High School and he went into his office and came back with this huge box full of Galaxy High School material. And I was, my mind was blown. It was just phenomenal to see all this development, artwork and scripts and the series Bible characters that never saw the light of day it was incredible and this is of course if you've followed me on social media this is the kind of thing that i want to bring to this channel eventually i've got enough material to do a very deep dive on the galaxy high school cartoon sadly 2017 was the last time i saw larry Tilio as he passed away in 2019 and yeah very greatly missed on this channel you'll often hear me talk about Tokyo Movie Shinsha as the Japanese animation studio because in the 1980s they really were. You had the likes of Toei Doga producing quality, quality stuff for Marvel Productions on Amazing Friends, Transformers. But Tokyo Movie Shinsha were primarily used by Deke to work on a lot of their shows and the work they turned in was phenomenal. Now what is interesting about Galaxy High School and a few other cartoons around this same time was Tokyo Movie Shinsha, the Japanese animation company, I guess kind of grew tired of just being the company that American studios outsourced to. So they decided to set up TMS Entertainment. Now TMS Entertainment were there. Now TMS Entertainment was created as a way of branding their own shows. So here are a bunch of TMS Entertainment shows. They produced a bunch of cartoons for America. Off the top of my head, the first one was The Blinkins. That was followed by Mighty Orbots, Galaxy High School, and one of the best shows of the 1980s that is so underappreciated, Bionic 6. Bionic 6 is phenomenal. And again, I really want to cover that on this channel. TMS Entertainment also did a bunch of shows for Europe, such as Sherlock Hound and a show I've never seen. I've seen clips of it, but I've never actually watched it called Reporter Blues, which visually almost looks like a drama. It's very interesting. But this was Tokyo Movie Shinsha basically entering the Western market. And you can understand why they wanted to do this, why they took these steps, because people would be watching Deke shows like The Real Ghostbusters and Mask, all these different shows. And the praise would primarily be going to Deke, for instance. Deke produced Inspector Gadget, but the animation for the first season was mostly done by Tokyo Movie Shinsha. Yet, they're almost like an afterthought to some degree. So TMS Entertainment was their way of saying, here we are, and these are the quality products we produce. If you look at Mighty Orbots, Galaxy High School here, Bionic 6, those three shows especially show just the potential for what TMS Entertainment were doing. So this episode, Welcome to Galaxy Eye, premiered on CBS on September 13th, 1986. As many of you may know, this show aired in a block that CBS were really pushing hard. Sadly, Galaxy High School failed in the ratings, which is such a shame, as I think this show was way ahead of its time with its visuals, way ahead of its time story-wise. As first episodes go, the story here does a great job of setting up the series. One of the frankly genius things that Galaxy High School did 
was that its introduction sequence told you the story prior to this episode's opening. So as soon as the episode begins, we already know who these characters are without them having to explain themselves. I've got to say, I love the voice cast for this show. It's not just good, it's really good. Hal Rail as Doyle, Susan Blue as Amy. Everyone thinks of Susan Blue as Arcee from the Transformers. I always think of her as Amy Brightow. There's just something about her voice that was so perfect for Amy. Susan Blue's voice has that kind of slight crack to it, and it just works wonderfully for Amy, I think. We haven't met. I'm Bully Bubblehead. Who are you? Amy. Hi, I'm Bully Bubblehead. I know. Huh? Jennifer Darling as Bowie Bubblehead and Wendy Garbo. Oh, that voice is so soothing. I mean, it's wonderful what she does. How she's able to go from the wacky, stuttering Bowie Bubblehead to the sultry tones of Wendy Garbo. It's fantastic. And famously, Nancy Cartwright, who would go on to voice Bart Simpson as Gilda Gossip. Hi, I'm Gilda Gossip, and I can tell you any secret you want to know. Billy Big Dipper says he's from Venus, but he's really from Saturn. And Clarence when you meet Flat Freddy in this series, I, I recall when I first saw The Simpsons, I remember thinking, that's Flat Freddy from Galaxy High School. This was before The Simpsons was the biggest show ever. And these days when you watch Galaxy High School, as soon as you hear Flat Freddy, you just can't not think of Bart Simpson. And of course, David L. Lander as Milo Davinus. I used to watch Twin Peaks and I always remember when he appeared in an episode that voice it kind of blew my mind at the time because it's such a recognizable voice and those are just the good students wait until we get to the bad students the funniest thing about Gilda Gossip that isn't always apparent is that her normal mouth not one of her additional ones she has a gold tooth that's such a bizarre thing that they included in the character design but I love it the character designs for this show by Chris Lucy are just phenomenal and throughout this pilot, heck, the series, the animation is just at a constantly high level. Much like Bionic 6, Tokyo Movie Shinsha were the best animation studio in the 80s. It's such a shame that these attempts to penetrate into the Western market weren't as successful as they had hoped. I, I love how Miss McBrain sees right through Doyle's charm. And this next scene, I always feel really sorry for Doyle. Amy is showered with a flying car and a scholarship, whereas Doyle is given a skateboard and no scholarship. Thank you, I... Ms. McBrain, I'm Doyle Cleverlow, and might I say that you are even more beautiful than I've heard. And might I say that you have an awful lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there are plans in the files for both of you. Let's take a look. I mean, I celebrate the animation. Look at this, a walking, talking blackboard. Look at the cleverness and smoothness of how the animators have him draw on his face. This series is so unique. You have Japanese animation, one of the best studios at the time, animating these bizarre character designs of John Chris Falusi. I always find that really fascinating, a proper example of East meets West and the end result is fantastic. Some would argue that the Japanese animators made these characters too normal and safe maybe, whereas Chris Falusi would have made them more grotesque in the way they moved. Just look at his work on Ren and Stimpy to see how far he would push the physical limitations of a character. My experience with this show was it aired on a show you may have heard me mention before called The Wide Awake Club, which was a Saturday morning kids TV show, like an entertainment show. And they would always have like one or two cartoons that they would show. And I still remember watching this show for the first time and my friend Roger, who would come around every Saturday, we would play with our mask toys or He-Man toys. And we were talking about this show nonstop. We were so impressed because it, it, it was... And this may sound strange, but it was such a cool show. You had very cool characters. You had a very cool setting. Maybe it's the high school thing, because there weren't many shows at the time that were focused on that. It was all fantasy, escapism, that kind of thing. Galaxy High School, whilst fantasy and definitely escapism, it was still grounded in the reality of what it was like to be at school, at a high school, with very real people, as opposed to barbarians or transforming robots. After the airings on the Wide Awake Club, it was re-ran on a show called Top Banana. And I remember that's when I recorded the entire series. They showed all 13 episodes and I recorded those to VHS. And I had that VHS for the longest time, up until I got a DVD recorder. The character work on Doyle as he becomes more and more frustrated with his situation. Oh, and coming up is one of my favourite pieces of animation in this episode, when Doyle meets Sludge, the janitor. 
the instant anger on Lil Sludge's face when Doyle patronizingly strokes his head to that beautiful animation of Sludge growing in size with a great sense of increase and intensity to his mass and the way he suddenly towers over Doyle, beautiful. Over here in the UK, two VHS volumes were actually released, but it must have been a very limited release because at the time, I was big into collecting VHS tapes, as all kids were. You wanted your favorite cartoons on tape, but I never saw these VHS tapes until I found them in bargain bins or charity shops in the 1990s. Also, I should mention that after this show was shown on the Wide Awake Club in 1988, it received a two-page comic strip in the pages of Lookin, which was a weekly magazine for kind of kids and teenagers, and it was hugely popular at the time. The funny thing is, one particular issue of Lookin had an image of Galaxy High School on the cover. But even back then, I knew there was something odd about this image of the characters as they looked really off, very odd. And I remember thinking that this was an episode that hadn't aired because the character designs were different. Amy was blue, Milo looked weird, Doyle was kind of more angular and had two-tone hair. It turns out that this image, which you have all probably seen on the internet by now, was one of a few promotional images created by John Christopher Lucy. He of Ren and Stimpy fame, and these days known for a plethora of negative reasons. Best you look them up yourself. Though being John Kay, he hates all of his work on Saturday morning cartoons. Which is a shame, because I really enjoyed his contributions at the time. I won't profess to ever being a fan of Ren and Stimpy, but I loved what he did with Ralph Bakshi in The New Adventures of Mighty Mouse, for example. There's a reason you see Mighty Mouse in the introduction sequence for Serial Geek TV. I love that cartoon. If you look at Sludge's back, he has these three hairs coming off it. And as we'll see, Beef Bonk has these hairs sticking out the side of his head, as does Luigi LeBouncy. Very much a John Chris Lucy character trait. He always liked adding weird little bits that most animation studios wouldn't do. This series does comedy animation so well, but of such a high quality. There was nothing like this on Saturday morning at the time, this strong. Also, we see that Sludge can get even bigger than we saw when he confronted Doyle. Here's an example of just how much effort was put into this show. Look at the animation throughout the lunch hall. Look at the character movements. When a character isn't talking, they're reacting or emoting or doing whatever the heck the animator decided to make them do. The scene with Amy, Gilda, Bowie, Wendy at the table, all these little movements. Oh yeah, now we get the creep. I just love this character. He's awfully wonderful. The last episode of the series has one of my favorite little moments when a huge Doyle Cleverlobe towers over the creep and the creep just sings, he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got, and he just collapses, it's brilliant. <laughs> But look at the creep and especially how Gilda reacts to him as well. If you look at those shots, they, the others all know the creep far too well. And just all the little touches, the winks, the the constant movement. The creep is such an... Uh, and there's those hairs I mentioned earlier. We're attached? That's the idea. Oh, come on. Unlock this thing. No, if I were to do that, uh, we, wouldn't, uh, not, we wouldn't be together for 24 hours a day. But I don't want to be together 24 hours a day. Uh, but, but I, <laughs> I do, and, and only I know the combination. Why do you think we call him the creep? And so we're about to see Doyle try and make friends very unsuccessfully. You first hear of the Bonk Bunch off camera laughing, and that's why Doyle decides to go and investigate. And with the bad guys, what a cast. We have Neil Ross playing Rotten Roland. If I remember rightly, Guy Christopher as Earl Eck. I'll have to look that up, but my favourite. John Stevenson as Beef Bonk. There was a time where I almost refused to believe that John Stevenson was playing Beef Bonk. Not because I didn't think he could, but the range difference. When I think of John Stevenson as a voice actor, I always think of Thundercracker from the Transformers, that deep, guttural voice. But Beef Bonk, it's more like a high-pitched punk. To me, it's so far removed from a lot of his other voice work. And when you think about it, quite a horrific scene on paper, Doyle Cleverlobe going into a machine and being turned into french fries. And yet not only is it played for comedy, but it is animated so amusingly with some of the french fries being Doyle's lips and eyebrows for expression. It's visually genius. And here we are in the science laboratory. We're about to meet Professor Eisenstein, voiced by Howard Morris, who was, my goodness, such a prolific voice actor. 
He had done voice acting for two decades before. You'll hear him in The Flintstones, for instance, a bunch of a bunch of Hanna-Barbera shows. I cannot stress that. Even some filmation stuff like Groovy Ghoulies. Such a wonderful actor. And by all accounts, an incredibly wonderful man. <laughs> so this is what Earth people look like. No, no, no. He fell into the French fryer. Look at the animation here. Again, the animation, Doyle shivering in his French fry form, as a tongue twister. Doyle actually inquires here, why is it so cold? And Milo explains that Professor Eisenstein comes from the planet Froster. Now, given that Larry Dottilio developed a lot of background work on this series and developed work on another series called She-Ra, Princess of Power, I do wonder if this is a little nod to a certain character on She-Ra that he also developed named Froster. These little, again, a, a wonderful scene that on paper would be quite basic, but the visuals and the animation, the comedy timing of each of these forms that Professor Eisenstein turns Doyle into, and even the end result where he comes out as a uh, a, a ball and you think, oh, it's it's gone wrong again, only for him to spring up. Oh, just wonderful. And it's the cleverness of these designs. When you look at Eisenstein, it's the way that ice forms is used to emphasize his elderly look, his beard shape, his baldness. It's all done so cleverly in that design. The premise of this show, a high school for alien students, may not on paper be the most original, but the writers did a fantastic job of exploring the premise. It really does allow for any writer jumping onto the series a great deal of freedom. You have a main cast of incredibly well-defined characters and you can introduce any characters you like into an episode because the only real limitation is your imagination and granted that goes for any kind of fantasy sci-fi writing. But I think with Galaxy High School you really can do so much with the premise. And that's kind of the beauty of Galaxy High School. Some episodes are tropes. The high school girl in love with the pop star. One of the gang believing his friends don't like him. The beach episode with characters trying to hit on one another. However, when you add in the alien possibilities of this series, each of those premises I just mentioned have new and exciting twists. Oh, now we're going to get something that's very 1980s and not seen in a lot of 1980s cartoons. This is very much a trope. This is a montage where we see... Amy style shopping with her friends. It's really awesome to see this transformation of Amy Bright Tower. Also, I can imagine for Chris Columbus, this was quite a fun scene to write because you're basically taking the trope of high schoolers going out and getting their makeup done or buying new clothes and turning it into something very different. <laughs> Some of these costumes are really odd, <laughs> like. The bird costume, I have no idea why that's there. This one always reminds me of um, Josie and the Pussycats, where she's got like this cat costume. Notice how they don't show the final costume. Great, great direction, because we don't know what her final look is going to be. Color. <laughs> Blue. And I should talk about her final look here. We see Amy get blue skin, which is something I kind of wish they'd kept because it makes her design look even cooler, especially with her costume, as you'll see. Now, the funniest thing is, in some of the development artwork for the series, Amy's prototype, as it were, the concept for Amy, was a blue skinned character. It wasn't necessarily Amy Bright Tower, but it was a blue skinned high school girl. I wonder if this scene where she is blue was a callback to that. And like I say, I would love to have seen Amy with blue skin throughout the series because I think it's it's a strong visual. A great gag there with the anchovy aliens seeing anchovies on their plates. Oh no, we most definitely did not order anchovies. And now we meet Luigi LeBouncy, again voiced by Howard Morris. As I've said before, this is 100% a Chris Lucy design. There was a similar proportion character in the New Adventures of Mighty Mouse cartoon. I say similar, pretty much the same body shape and design, even down to the hairs on the shoulders. Maybe that's something I should feature on the channel at some point. I mentioned little touches in animation. Just look at when Doyle delivers the pizzas to the girls. Wendy blows him a kiss and he does this little anime salute that we see that all the best Japanese studios worked into their western produced cartoons. Basically it's a salute that has two fingers away from the temple accompanied by a wink. And now we get to see that the characters of Doyle and Amy have had their roles kind of completely reversed. Amy Brighttower is now popular and getting a lot of attention 
whereas Doyle Cleverlobe is not popular and, to be quite honest, is a bit of a joke. And without spoiling the series, things don't really improve for him all that much. Look at this scene where they're dancing. Amy's dancing, Doyle's dancing. All the background characters are dancing as well. That's, I mean, that one on the left there, his dancing, I don't know what he's doing to be honest, but yeah, there's so much going on. You've got the lights as well. There's, there's a lot of work going into just each and every one of these shots. I always love it that when Beef gets mad, he turns blue and his eyes go red. That's such a nice little gimmick. Rotten Roland in the series, like in the pilot, in this first episode, he doesn't get much material, but as the series goes on, he gets to do a lot more and he becomes such a funny character. Suckle ball? I think on Earth you call it hooky. That's hockey. Yes, only the puck is alive. Oh, now we get the Zuggleball finale, which is a chance for Doyle to redeem himself, given that the first episode has pretty much mocked him from start to finish. Oh, and listen here to Coach Frogface. Doyle versus Beef. And the question on everyone's lips, Riggit. who will score the three points that win the game? Riggit. That is the voice of Pat Fraley, another fine talent whom you may know as Brave Star, most famously probably Krang from Ninja Turtles. Actually, when you listen to Coach Frogface talk, you can hear a few little gimmicks that Fraley would eventually use for Krang. Yeah, the Zuggable finale. <laughs> I love all the little touches to the animation here with Beef bullying Doyle off the ice before they've even started. And the idea that the Zuggle Ball wants to be struck. One of the bizarre things is in the model sheet for Doyle, he's actually holding a Zuggle Ball. It's a weird thing. It says Doyle with Zuggle Ball. It's like, why was that a part of his model sheet? <laughs> I don't quite know why. And again, if you look at the crowd shots, they're always doing something in the far away shots, not so much. And that's not because of laziness. Tokyo Movie Shinsha didn't do laziness. It's because having a distant background animated to move as well as foreground animation would just make it very hard to separate the two visually. Whereas a lot of the closer shots of the crowd, you see so many character designs, so much work going into it. Yeah, the rules of Zuggle Ball seem to be a little bit uh, loose. <laughs> it's so weird when you think of the premise of this game. Zuggle Ball is about a little alive creature that wants to get struck, wants to be hit, wants to end up in the mouth of a giant whale that shoots it back out. How do you describe that to someone? Let's see you win this now. Doyle, play football! Doyle, play football! Great shot there when he kicks the Zuggle Ball. Boink. And again, if there are no rules in Zuggle Ball, then Doyle is very entitled to, to do what he does. Amy makes the save to a degree. And thus, from this moment on, <laughs> Beef Ponk is going to make it his mission to ensure that Doyle's life on Galaxy High is a nightmare. The end to this episode is just perfect, because yeah, Doyle has gained some of his former popularity back, he seems to be taken quite seriously, even by his locker, who had dismissed him earlier. But yeah, in true kind of high school jock fashion, Doyle thinks that, well, now I've won the day, now I can get that date with Amy. And it does look like it's going to go that way for a second. What are you doing Friday night? No plans. How would you like a date? Oh, with Amy, I could. Yeah, that'd be fun. Good. Then you can go out with... Gilda Gossip! Until, of course, Doyle gets his comeuppance for the way he treated Amy at the start of the episode. <laughs> Again, look at the animation here with Gilda. I was up there. <laughs> That's a great final shot to the episode. So yeah, Galaxy High School. Expect more Galaxy High School content on this channel in the coming years because I have a lot to say about this show. Plus all of that behind the scenes material that the late, great Larry Dottilio gave me. I know for a fact he'd want me to share all that with the masses. So keep a lookout. And that's the end of this episode commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one.